Great. Oh. <laughs> Welcome, Samir. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so Samir Patel is going to talk today about uh, privacy and uh, issues around uh, there's no app for that. So, I, I, you know, I'll just let you hand over and tell, tell us about your talk. Uh, sure. But yeah, I think just to say we're reminiscing of the day, wasn't it? We first met each other at uh, Kai PC meetings. Five, many, like, years. many years ago and just uh, lamenting the fact they're now gone right and it's now well they're virtual but it's not, it was quite a nice experience spending two days in a room deciding the fate of Kai papers and, uh, that was a uh, an experience that was quite valuable I think but we can talk more about that at the end afterwards but for now though really look forward to hearing your talk on privacy thanks thank, thank you. you well thank you <laughs> thanks Duncan for inviting me thanks to all of you for being in here instead of in this beautiful weather that you have outside. Um, and as Duncan said, I am, Duncan and I know each other for a while and I was so happy to come and visit. Um, I am, I recently joined the University of Utah. I'm an associate professor there uh, in the Colored School of Computing. So before I start the presentation, let's have a quick show of hands with the people in the room, how many of you are concerned about your privacy? Okay, some people are not, but keep your hand up if you are concerned. All right, and then how many of you, wait, wait, don't, keep it up, keep it raised. Uh, how many of you use apps? Okay, so everybody who was concerned about privacy still had their hands up uh, when they use apps. Right, um, and that's really the overarching question that we've been trying to understand is why is it that people continue to use apps even though they're invasive, even though people know that they're invasive, even though people are, are concerned about their privacy when they use these apps, okay? And the talk today is going to be a collection of um, various pieces of research that we've done in this space, uh, starting with some semi-structured interviews uh, that we did using uh, realistic scenarios of app use. And based on what we found in these scenarios, we created um, an experiment based on a specific scenario uh, that we then deployed as a separate study. One of the scenarios that we used was uh, about a smart thermometer uh, that was to be an app for a smart thermometer that could be used in a public health emergency, um, if you can imagine what that might be. Uh, although we did not explicitly say that it was COVID, but this was being done during COVID times. Um, and based on the analysis of um, what we found during that particular, the answers to that particular scenario, we designed an experiment, again, similar scenario about a smart thermometer app that we deployed on a larger scale um, in the US and in India. And we have some comparison of those two. And then uh, as a follow-up study, we actually talked to people specifically about COVID-19 contact tracing apps. So the smart thermometer was an indirect way of getting people to think about it. Here, we directly talked to people from the US, India, and the Middle East about their experiences with COVID-19 and, um, and their views of contact tracing apps. And what I'm going to present today is the various things that we found in these individual studies, but also then tie them together um, in terms of how they're connected. So let's start with the scenario-based study. And this is again, uh, a bunch of my co-authors uh, on that study. Uh, we, as I said, the premise there was we all use apps uh, and they all have benefits, right? We love the apps because they give us a lot of benefits, but they're also very data hungry. And that's what causes the invasiveness. And people have, as I said, right? Users, even though they use these apps, have experienced and reported lots of different kinds of negative experiences with these apps. And these are covered by a whole bunch of ways in which they express these negative feelings. And an umbrella concept that's often used to describe this is creepiness. Uh, but yet it's also not necessarily clear what exactly creepiness means. So we wanted to get some traction on well, what exactly is creepiness? Uh, 
why are people using apps uh, even though they might find them quote unquote creepy and the ways in which app makers typically get around this is they say well we give you some control over privacy right there are privacy settings and options so you can control your privacy so we wanted to look at okay well does that matter so really what uh, these scenarios wanted to get at was do people feel empowered to control their privacy with these options and if they feel empowered is that what is mitigating these invasiveness invasive practices and the privacy concerns that they engender so that was the overarching research question that we started with and we did semi-structured interviews as i said uh, using a bunch of scenarios that we very carefully crafted for app use with 25 participants uh, from the US roughly um, equally split across uh, men and women and a couple of non-binary individuals. And these um, eight scenarios plus the ninth one, which I mentioned, which was about the smart thermometer, uh, but the first set of findings I'll talk about are for the eight scenarios, core scenarios. Uh, is, these were about everyday use, like you're booking travel, you're listening to music, you're exercising. So apps that people use on their phones, uh, that were described uh, in these scenarios. So here's an example. Uh, it's about a chatting app and all it describes is, you know, you're chatting and you're noticing advertisements. So again, if you can notice here, this is pretty similar to what people already know about, you know, how ad tracking works. Uh, so it's a plausible case. So it's not completely made up as in it might not exist. And the important thing to notice in this scenario here is that there is some sense of empowerment. So the user can tell Facebook that this ad is inappropriate so that they, they have some, at least some perceived sense of control here. And so all the other scenarios there are they are in the paper. Uh, so I won't go through all of them here, but the, the goal here is to get you to see that they were realistic, that they described some level of uh, privacy threat or creepiness, also some utility, and some uh, ways in which people could control their pri privacy. Okay, any questions? All right, so for each of these scenarios, we presented that to our interviewees and got their uh, responses about how they would react, what their thoughts were, and what did we find? Well, what we found relates to the concept of power, because remember, we were also looking at does do these privacy controls empower people to manage their privacy? And we related that to the concept of power as it's discussed in the literature, in human computer interaction, as well as in, in general. And just a brief summary here, uh, basically power can be construed in two terms. One is power over, and the other is power to. And the way to think about them is power to gives you the ability to enact some capability, right? That might be your privacy setting. So you have the power to adjust that. But the way they are related is that that power to do something is constrained by the larger system that decides how effective that action is going to be because of the power that the app or the ecosystem or the larger system has over you, right? So. One way to think about this is, you know, these, it's like a nested doll. So the power to do something, the capability you have is nested within the power that the app, the platform, the device has over you. So the capacity or the effectiveness of whatever it is that you have the power to do is determined by the larger system, right? And, what we found was in our answers, this theoretical understanding of power uh, came through in very salient ways. So what we identify here is what, some, what we call conditional empowerment. So privacy controls or privacy settings in apps, uh, yes, they empower you, but that empowerment is not absolute, it's conditional. And here's a participant quote that illustrates how that uh, plays out, right? So in the sense that this participant is essentially talking about the power that Google has over this person. It's a no, even if they enact certain privacy controls, ultimately 
they're operating within a state in which their information is known to Google, but also lots of other people are using apps and it's kind of expected here, right? That, well, Google knows everything anyway. And so if Google knows everything, your power to then control what Google can and cannot know is enacted within that system of, um, that operates. Right? So basically, uh, the end user privacy controls that we have are providing empowerment in a very deceptive way because of the power structure, the power of the user to do something versus the power that the platforms, the apps, the devices have over the users. And so what ends up happening is, yes, you have some privacy control, but it's very limited, extremely limited. And one of the perverse effects of that is users do not necessarily see this relationship as to how much control they have. So they're internalizing the responsibility of privacy control. So in some sense, if I don't have privacy, it's because I failed somehow to use the control that was given to me without necessarily acknowledging or recognizing that the control that is given to you as a user is you're, you're only conditionally empowered. You're not truly empowered, right? And so the responsibility of privacy violations when users uh, experience them, they blame themselves for not acting uh, the right way, right? Uh, so that, that was the first set of findings that uh, we had and that led, led us to then uh, question, okay, so then can we look at whether people understand technology more or whether the, uh, the extent to which they feel these negative emotions, uh, would that affect their, their feelings of you know, app use or their intention to use apps and whether that will, whether having even perceived power control, uh, but perceived control over privacy versus not, would that uh, affect anything? So that's led us to create a scenario that we varied systematically in an experiment. And that was published as the next paper in this series uh, at CHI, again, uh, with these co-authors. And the main research question there was, well, yes, there, there is privacy control, it's conditional, it's perceived, uh, but does that still matter for whether people continue to use these inv invasive apps? And Again, whether people continue to use an invasive app is uh, dependent on how literate they are, how tech literate they are, and the extent to which they feel these negative emotions. So here's the core scenario that we used. Uh, this is about a fictitious app called Remember Music. Uh, it's essentially, if you play some song, it will identify it. And again, as you can uh, see here, it says that you get ads, right? And so the scenario describes that you found this app, you used it, it identified some song for you, you started seeing some ads, and now you're just kind of using this app. So that was the core um, premise that was used as the control condition. And again, you can see this is, these kinds of apps already exist. So we're not making up, making something up that um, is out of the realm of possibilities. In fact, it already exists. And we varied this systematically to create our treatment conditions. Uh, so there are three treatment conditions uh, to vary how technology can make things creepy or creepier. Um, so what are these? First one was there was an expectation violation. So this app would collect your location. Now, why would you really expect something that identifies music to collect location? Um, and so here's kind of the text that was added to the scenario uh, to tell people that, you know, it was using location data and you were not really aware. The second treatment uh, was what we call breach of personal boundaries. So in this case, the app got some uh, inappropriate information and without your permission, related to the music again, and without your permission, it showed it, shared it, to your friends on social media. So it was a boundary violation, right? You, I did not expect you to post this on my behalf uh, to people I know. So here's that text that was added to for that condition. 
And then the third condition was where it was collecting superfluous data, but it was ambiguous how that was happening. So with location data, which was also superfluous, people are used to location-based services and apps. So people can at least know, yes, if it's collecting location data, it's collecting it because of GPS. But here, um, essentially it was not clear. Was your microphone on? Did you have access? How did it get this ambient data? So we just said it was basically, it might have been listening ambiently. We didn't really specify. Uh, so in this case, there were superfluous data, but it was ambiguous what exactly was happening. It was not really clear, right? So, so that was the text that was described for that. So there's, there's all the three variations, the treatment variations. And within each, uh, we, so these were the three, Variations and within each of these, uh, we varied whether the person had control over privacy or not. So basically, for each version, we just added extra text. One and so well for giving people privacy control. So again, the core treatment had nothing, and then the versions with privacy control specified that, for instance, you can control if those inappropriate things are shared with your friends or you can control whether it listens or something like that, right? Um, so that gives us six treatment conditions, right? The three types of violations and then one without and one with privacy and then the control. So basically we got people's consent and then either they were in either the control or they got one of these six treatments and then we asked them about affective perceptions of this app, right? How is it affecting you negatively uh, in various uh, ways, uh, emotional ways? Um, and then we asked about some standard scales about privacy concern from apps. We measured whether um, they were technically savvy or not using the general digital difficulty scale and then collected basic demographics. So essentially our, um, participant pool was drawn from Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, we had about uh, a, a little bit more than 100 participants in each condition and we compared across these conditions. Uh, and participants were adults from like 18 to 78. So it's, uh, I think mean age was about 36. Uh, so it's not a heavily student or just young sample. It was a pretty diverse sample. And what we wanted to look at is this particular question that we asked them, now that you know this, would you still continue to use this app, right? And that was really our predictor variable was, well, why do people use such apps, right? So that's what we wanted to get at. And we wanted to measure if this was dependent on whether they had privacy control or not. So again, across those two scenarios, or whether the amount of affective discomfort they experienced was a lot or a little. And for this, by the way, we actually developed the scale. So remember, as I said earlier, uh, there's this umbrella concept of creepiness and it wasn't really clear what that means. So we used some uh, literature from uh, on creepiness as well as on negative affect. And we came up with a scale to measure how an app can uh, um, influence affect. Uh, so we measured that. And then, um, Last one was just perceived data literacy as we measured with the digital difficulty scale. So how, how tech savvy are you? And so really what we wanted to look at is whether or not you continue to use this app depends on uh, whether you have privacy control over the app, how negatively do you perceive the app or what kind of negative emotional response that the extent of negative emotional response that it elicits and how tech savvy do you self-report yourself to be? All right, so let's get to what did we find? Well, first let's look at the superfluous data condition, right? The violation of expectations, just collecting location data unexpectedly. Here, privacy control had no effect. Whether or not you had privacy control is the same uh, in terms of whether you would use this app. Uh, but affective discomfort did have an impact. So the more negatively you felt about the app or the more negative uh, affect that it elicited, the less likely it is that people were willing to use the app, okay? Now, interestingly, we thought 
that, well, if you're tech savvy, you're going to know a lot more about privacy issues and you'll be less likely to use the app. Now, that was not true. It was the opposite. People who judged themselves to be more tech savvy uh, were much more likely to use the app, controlling for all other things. Okay. So now let's look at the other kind of violation, which was breach of personal boundaries. Again, comparing across conditions, right? With or without privacy control. Same thing, privacy control, doesn't matter whether you have, you're given privacy control or not. Affective discomfort, same. The more discomfort you feel, the less likely you are to use the app. And same effect with tech literacy. The more you believe you, are, you know about technology, the more likely you are to continue using the app. And then the last condition where the threat was ambiguous, uh, once again, no impact of privacy control. Now, interestingly here, affective discomfort didn't have an impact either. So even if you felt, whether you felt more or less negative in terms of affect or emotion, didn't influence uh, whether you would continue using the app. And same. If you are more tech savvy, self-reported, the more likely you are to use these apps. All right, so what does it all mean, right? Uh, the way we interpret this is clearly users are uncomfortable with some of the data practices that we saw because they expressed discomfort. But if the threat is ambiguous, the default is I'm gonna use the app even if I feel some kind of discomfort, okay? Uh, and <laughs> all the more so if they think that they know a lot about technology, okay? So essentially three things going on here. One is people kind of just are uncomfortable as you all, many of you were, right? Privacy concern. Uh, but if it's not really clear why they should be uncomfortable as like when the threat was, un was ambiguous, they'll use the app anyway. And if they feel like they know a lot about how technology works, they're much more likely to do it. Okay. Uh, so this was interesting. And one other reason that we didn't find in this study, and I, I won't get into the details of, but remember I said that one of the scenarios was about the smart thermometer app in our interviews. And uh, what we found in that was another consideration there was even if people felt uncomfortable, uh, they would use it for the greater good. So the smart thermometer scenario was about public health emergency, you know, making sure that the pandemic is controlled. And so one of the other reasons that they provided was, well, we'll you know, because yes, I'm uncomfortable, but it helps a lot of people and it's, it's better for the greater good, so I will use it. So we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into all of this and actually see, well, would it matter what kind of a person you are? So here, the, the previous studies looked at, does the app make you feel uncomfortable? Um, here we looked at, are you, the, the social orientation that you have, and social orientation is a concept that we're, about whether one is individualistic or collectivistic. It's applied oftentimes to cultures, but it can also be applied to individuals. Uh, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Individualistic versus collectivists. Okay, many people, but just the basic um, idea here is uh, countries like the US or also many countries in Western Europe uh, tend to be culturally very individual focused uh, and also individuals in these countries, whereas other countries, say India or more of the, some of the Eastern countries, Japan, China, uh, focus more on collectivist uh, outcomes and also just in, uh, they tend to be more oriented towards uh, collections, uh, family, neighborhoods, uh, nation. And so what we wanted to look at is whether personally an individual, whether their orientation is more individualistic or collectivist, would that matter, especially for an app that is about a public health type emergency. 
And also, would it matter how the app is sold to you, how the app is framed, how the app is described? If, it, if the app is described as it benefits you versus if the app is described as it benefits everybody, all of us. Um, so that's what we wanted to study. And so we, the first um, cut of that, we started in the US, really looking at does what a person's social orientation, would does that predict whether they will use uh, such an app for tracking a pandemic, the contact tracing type apps? And is it also influenced by how that app is framed uh, in terms of, is it framed collectively or individualistically? And what we wanted to look at here was, would you use such an app, honestly? Obviously, all of you know that contact tracing just by definition requires some invasiveness, right? That it's gonna have some privacy implications. Um, would people then actually take the actions that the app recommends, like quarantine yourself, wear masks, whatever, because again, those actions are inconvenient, uh, personally inconvenient, even if they might be publicly beneficial. And then would people continue using such, for, for example, a smart thermometer, even after there is no more public health emergency? So those were the three things we were interested in. And again, in the US, we used a mechanical Turk sample of about 400 people. And you can see, again, this being an American sample, uh, majority of the people are dominant individualists and many fewer were collectivists, but enough for us to do some comparisons. And again, we screened people, uh, control just had a, a neutral description of the app. Whereas in the treatment conditions, we either said this app is going to benefit you personally. So it was the, the descriptions were varied very carefully and all of that, the details are in the paper. Uh, but as an example, the description would say, this is a benefit for you personally or an action for you personally. Whereas uh, the collectivist framing would say something like people in your community or people in your neighborhood, okay. and then we asked for their privacy concerns through um, a scale, standard scale, and whether they were individualists or collectivists by, again, a standard scale that measures individualism and collectivism and collected some demographics. So the model we had is the cumulative link model, really the dependent variable, remember I said, whether they will uh, use such an app, that they will take the actions that the app recommends and will they continue using it, right? So for each of those dependent variables, we looked at was it influenced by age, gender, how the app was described, individualistic or collectivistic, and what the person's orientation was, individualistic or collectivistic, and whether that interacted with each other. So that was the, uh, the model. So let's look at some of these results one by one here. Uh, so first was, would you use this app honestly? Here we found, yes, social orientation makes a difference. People who are more collectivists were much more likely to use the app more honestly. Okay, And framing also made a difference here. The, the interaction effect between social orientation and social framing but this was very interesting. Collectivists were more likely to use the app if it was framed individualistic. We don't know why. So our hypothesis going in was, if you're a collectivist and you're told this is gonna benefit everybody, you're gonna be much more likely to use the app. We found the opposite uh, compared to the control condition, right? And again, these, the actual numbers here are less important. Um, this is about, whether you would follow what the app tells you. And again, we found social orientation makes a difference and collectivists are much more likely to do this. Same with the interaction effects. Uh, collectivists are much more likely to take app recommended actions if they're described in individualist terms. And then the last one was, would you long-term use? So would you continue using this smart thermometer even, even though there's no longer any public health emergency? And here we found again, social framing compared to the control condition, in this case, also individualists. 
So if uh, compared to whether the app was, how the app was described, if it was described neutrally, uh, the use was much less. But if it was described with either individualistic or collectivistic framing, people would use this a lot more, right? So this was the only condition in which the actual framing of how the app was described made a difference, whether people will use it longer term, okay? And social orientation, again, same. Collectivists were much more likely to do this. So basically what we found was a person's social orientation, whether they're dominant individualist or dominant collectivist, predicts uh, whether they perceive that this app is beneficial, whether they will take the actions that the app recommends, and whether they will continue using such an app. And as I said, unexpectedly we found that the expected use by collectivists was higher when they saw an individualist framing of this app. And we're not necessarily sure uh, why that might be the case. But then we repeated this study in India to see, well, does it actually matter across cultures? Uh, especially since India is known to have a lot more of a collectivist orientation. So that was the follow-up study, same study, exact same study, but now with a sample from India, okay? So this was the Indian sample, uh, smaller, a little bit smaller than the US, but you can already see that uh, the proportion of collectivists is a lot higher um, in this sample. And again, you know, it's, it's pretty balanced in terms of ages and uh, where they are located. All right, so any guesses? Did we find the same results or different results? US versus India, anyone? Same. Exactly the same. Okay, why? Because there's less uh, trust in the data. Okay, so you're saying that the results were the same, but the, the explanatory factors might be different. Why they're the same? Because like in the US, people maybe want to trust in the government in the pandemic. As somebody who lives in the US, I would say that is absolutely not true. Uh, in general, people trusting in the government for anything for at any time is much less in the US would be my guess. Uh, but yes, any other guesses? By the way, here's what we found in the US, okay? We found that depending on social orientation, based on whether you're individualist or collectivist, um, all of the variables dependent on that. They were different across individualists and collectivists. So you're saying exactly the same. Any others? What do people on Zoom think? They don't say. They don't think anything. All right. Um, so good, good guess. Almost. So for all of the variables that talk about the use, Yes, it was the same, except for long-term use. So this is just, is it beneficial? Will you do what it says? And you know, will you use it? But the Indian effect was restricted to the pandemic times. As soon as we told them, okay, would you do this once the emergency is over? There was no effect, okay? But interest, so, the interesting thing here is that in the US, we didn't expect social orientation to have an effect, but the framing would, the interaction, whereas we did find one and we found, we expected differences between India and the US, whereas we didn't. We found that India was, um, as, at least as far as three of the outcome variables goes, uh, very similar. But the twist, again, is, Privacy concerns. So this is what we found about the US. So long-term privacy concerns predicted whether you would continue using the app for over once the pandemic is over, but not during the pandemic, okay? That, again, that intuitively makes sense, right? That, oh, remember I was telling you how people said, I will do this for the greater good. That was a US sample. And so this confirms some of that, which is, yes, there is an emergency right now. And so I'm willing to suspend some of my privacy concerns 
in order to use this app and benefit everybody. So that's why you're seeing for the short-term things, privacy concern didn't have an effect, but as soon as the you said, okay, the public health emergency is over, privacy concern mattered for whether you would use such an app long-term. That was different in India. No influence of privacy concern on anything. And so this is also where, for instance, cultural differences may play a part because if you look at the literature, um, in general, it's shown that there, the ways in which privacy is conceptualized in India, the ways in which people are even aware of their privacy rights or care about them is quite different. And so that uh, you can see in these results here. Okay. Uh, any questions? All right, so then let's move to the last piece in here, which is, so remember this was, again, yeah. Sorry, what was your question? Our prediction? No, no, like, so you asked me why I don't really think, what, do you have a, a different like, So we, we thought that the results in India would be drastically different simply because uh, the, the two cultures are so different, particularly on the social orientation side, right? That, uh, U.S. tends to have a much bigger proportion of uh, collectivists, uh, sorry, individualists, were, uh, as opposed to India, uh, but we didn't uh, find it. But again, we did find some differences, but not necessarily as many as we thought and along the same lines as we thought. So you don't have an idea about why uh, yeah, so I think the, the at least for as far as privacy concern goes, I think uh, we we believe that it's because people are less aware of these things and care may not necessarily care about them in the same. So, for instance, uh, data protection, consumer privacy, all of those things are very saliently discussed here. There is legal uh, Europe and U.S. There are legal mechanisms. Uh, the same level of regulatory awareness, consumer awareness does not exist in India. That's already shown in the literature. So, uh, but this is, again, this, this study, even though it took place during the pandemic, it was a smart thermometer app. It was described as a public. So we didn't, we didn't mention COVID-19 in any of these. Okay, so this was, you know, we, we figured people are gonna extrapolate their living in a pandemic. So, but, we followed up with a, an interview study in which we actually explicitly talked about COVID-19 again with these authors here. And this was what we wanted to understand is again, from various different cultures, in this case explicitly contact tracing apps for pandemic, right? So in this case, there was no fictitious scenario. We actually said COVID-19 contact tracing apps, uh, how do you understand them and how do you discuss them? And how does that translate to just how vulnerable people feel and just the concept of vulnerability in human computer interaction in general? So basically we interviewed people to cover these questions, uh, starting with, you know, how are, what's your personal experience of COVID-19? Uh, what is your opinion on these apps or contact tracing uh, using, done using these apps? And then in general, what do you think about using technology for responding to COVID-19 and just similar kinds of public health emergencies? We talked to 10 people from the US, uh, eight from India, and then five spread all over the Middle East um, and did some comparison across those uh, regional answers as well. So again, as you can see, um, roughly equally distributed across male and female, broad age range. What we found based on thematic analysis of these interviews uh, could be roughly grouped into some major themes. So first was just people offering their opinions about contact tracing, pandemic tracking apps in general the discomfort they experienced because of the pandemic and maybe also because of these apps themselves, their own discomfort. Um, and then just in general, remember tying back to affective concerns about data practices of these apps and, and other apps in general. So let's go through them one by one. First was again, 
a little bit surprising for us is nearly all of our participants were thought that these apps were a positive thing. Uh, so here are some couple of quotes uh, from somebody in India saying it's just absolutely definitely a good idea. Or uh, this person, for example, saying, yeah, they will scare people into being better. So it's good because people would otherwise not necessarily do the right thing, but these apps will get them to do that. Uh, so they were not opposed to these apps at all. In fact, they welcomed, uh, many of them welcomed them. At the same time, uh, just like in the scenarios, they expressed affective discomfort and that was tied to vulnerability, right? I mean, everybody was vulnerable during these times. First of all, just by definition, we were biologically vulnerable to COVID-19, but because of the disruption of life, uh, people were vulnerable in a lot of different ways. And so as this uh, participant talks about, for instance, right, the life experience, it's very uncomfortable to just live in isolation. Uh, or this person says, it's just, I'm home all the time. It's very frustrating. We're just not used to living like this. And these ways in which they characterize their own vulnerability was also then discussed in terms of the apps. Uh, so for example, the data practices that these apps will have, right? That again, even though participants found that the apps were useful, they also felt that, well, I'm already vulnerable to the pandemic and now my data is being collected. So that adds to my vulnerability here. Or um, somebody is saying right, yeah, we get the benefit of contact tracing, but something's lost and privacy is lost here. And interestingly note here in this um, quote, tying back to the first things I presented about conditional empowerment, right? This is similar to the person in the initial study, what they said about Google, well, we're being tracked anyway, correct? So what's the difference? And you know, I don't really know. Uh, so from a theoretical perspective, what we found was the pandemic related discomfort and the acceptability or annoyance with these apps uh, could be located in a, in a temporal spectrum with three different kinds of temporalities. There was the present, the pandemic right now is going on and you're experiencing the present based on what you used to do in the past. So a lot of discomfort in the present is because what you are used to, your routine, the things that you know are disrupted. They're no longer the same. And so you are experiencing a vulnerability that's absolutely currently happening in real. The other thing was just what's coming in the near future. And so because, again, you're currently experiencing something in the near future, it's still going to continue, maybe not, you don't know when it's gonna end. And so you're anticipating still continuing that vulnerability and that feeds back because even though you're anticipating it in the near future, you're also experiencing that anticipation currently, right? And what we identified is, for most design as technologists, as human computer interactions, we're focusing on the near future. What's coming in maybe a few months, perhaps a year down the line. Uh, however, interestingly, what we identified was when it comes to technologies such as contact tracing apps or apps in general that become infrastructure because you know apps are now every, everywhere. Everybody uses apps of various kinds. There is a third level of temporality uh, which extends beyond just the proximal future. And what we really wanted to ask theoretically is when we're focusing as technology builders, technology designers, human computer interaction researchers, we're focusing just on making the present better in the proximal future, what do we lose? And what we call this is a focus on the distant future uh, that is as, illust as illustrated by this quote here, because this person is not talking about strange new world right now in, in a year or so. They're just talk, imagining how things would be 
say five, 10 years from now, when people have just accepted these kinds of apps and they have become invisible and in infrastructure and it's just kind of taken for granted, right? Remember I was talking about how people are just expected, expecting that there will be discomfort when using apps. And what we call this is speculative vulnerability. And this is, so this, this connects to a temporality that is conditional and hypothetical. So here, people are imagining what might come to pass based on what has already come to pass currently. But for the distant future, this depends on people are imagining it's conditional and hypothetical. If this happens in a year and it becomes part of the infrastructure and invisible, how might the future look like? So there might be multiple possibilities going on here, four or five different ways of how things could be that will then impact the future, the distant future in different ways. And so people were speculating if the contact tracing apps, for example, one future could be, they just go away. If that happens, our, the distant future looks very different from another could be, and this is again real, right? So there are hospitals now who say, okay, everybody has a contact tracing app forever. So if we ever have any other public health emergency, we're ready. That future looks very different if everybody just is expected and has a contact tracing app on their phone all the time, right? So, but currently in our design practices, as well as in our theoretical lenses, we don't necessarily take um, that kind of distant future and that kind of infrastructuralization of technology sufficiently into account. And so that's um, our work basically calls for these emergent or speculative futures that might come to pass as a way to take, um, to imagine how do we support technology in, in a way that we're not just looking at the user and the screen, but how it impacts just the life and the context in which people live, not just today or our proximate future, but for future generations. And it also calls then into, uh, you know, calls for taking into account things like not just the technological immediate um, properties, but what's our social responsibility? Who trusts whom, right? You were talking about trust in government. Uh, what happens uh, in terms of uh, whether these apps are doing stuff honestly or not? Uh, what's the ethical way in which this technology could be designed, not just for the immediate future, but assuming that it becomes infrastructure or it becomes invisible, what kind of infrastructure, technological infrastructure do we want to design for our future generations? So at the end, I just want to thank, uh, so obviously you've seen a bunch of my co-authors on various works. Uh, there were other individuals who assisted us in these um, as well. And of course, our study participants, as well as people who gave us the money. Uh, this work actually started when I was at Indiana University before I moved to um, the University of Utah. And just to summarize the main points, uh, what we found as an answer to, you know, why people continue to use apps uh, despite having privacy concerns is, well, first of all, they're conditionally empowered and they may not necessarily recognize it, uh, but they, the empowerment that they currently have is really situated within the broader social technical systems in which other entities, systemic entities have power over them. But because of this, people have just come to expect that apps are going to be creepy, that they will cause discomfort. So even though people experience persistent discomfort, uh, it's just become normalized. It's a normalized aspect of app use, regardless of whether we presented, you know, different scenarios, whether we uh, uh, did controlled experiments, whether we actually talked to people about uh, real apps, all of these themes came through uh, in a similar way. So basically, because creepiness has been normalized, that's why apps are still creepy after all these years. And now I will take some questions.
questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as ever, we've got people online. So if you if you've got questions, uh, the microphone. And obviously, folks online, if you want to type any questions in, that's also great. Yeah. So just one sub theme seems Ooh. to be that the more technically literate people are, the more likely they are to be to go along with it. So that's a good point. We were surprised by that too. So that might need a little bit more unpacking, for example, why that is. Uh, one way to explain, potentially explain that, could be to um, the two. Uh, in two different sub facets. One could be that because they're technically, or at least they self-rate themselves as technically more savvy, uh, they may feel that they have a better understanding of how exactly privacy can or cannot be violated. And so uh, they might feel that, okay, I'm using it in ways in which it isn't. Or another could be that, oh, because I am, you know, I feel like, I know technology a lot more. I know how to use the controls to you to manage privacy in ways um, that I can. Uh, so that could be one aspect. Another could be that maybe they're limiting their use in various ways that is not captured in these scenarios. So because one of the other, um, this is not something we talked about, but some other studies that we've done is about uh, limited or selective or non-use of technology. And one of the facets in there is people use just very limiting their use in various ways as a privacy preserving tactic. And typically what we found is that the more tech savvy you are, the more likely you are to do it and the more um, specialized ways in which you might do it. And again, that could potentially mm. explain this, but I, because we didn't expect it, we don't have a concrete explanation of why that is. I mean, the, the other sub theme I found interesting was the idea that if you give people a certain amount of power, um, if something goes wrong, they somehow blame themselves more. So, and just to close the loop on the other way mm -hmm. of interpreting the, um, the self-rated tech savviness could be that people who are tech savvy maybe overconfident well, I think in that's, their abilities. To me, that's what it right. says. So, so that could also be the case. So, so they're actually more vulnerable because they think that, okay, I can do better, but they're not. And yes, uh, the second point that you made points to the fact that it's people are given these privacy preferences and control, which ostensibly uh, it's, it's like a mild placebo effect, right? That here you can control your privacy uh, but yeah, but that control is very limited in some sense. And then, you know, you add to this the fact that uh, nowadays where so, everything is so interconnected that even if you don't even use an app, uh, your privacy still might be affected because your wonderful friends use apps and put your information in their address books and share your photos on Facebook. And, you know, face recognition is basically has enough data to identify everybody anyway. I mean, it, it's, uh, yeah. not, it's not a more, I suppose, mundane explanation that why people continue to use their apps is that they are resigned to it. They yes. don't feel they have any control over so it. Actually, but, one of, I mean, GDPR, et cetera, may exist, but well, it doesn't in the US. And um, you you have that funny situation in the US where people seem to trust Apple more to protect their privacy than the FBI. So one of the papers that I presented today, actually, the title is Empowering Resignation. So it's not only that they're resigned to it. It's just that these types of things are perpetuating and empowering not true privacy, but even more resignation. Uh, but what I would also add is this, is this also illustrates why simply UI or UX alone or app design or software alone cannot address this issue, we do need that to work in concert with thoughtful and uh, well-enforced laws and regulations, right? It's just simply having laws and regulations is also not important because they need to actually make sense and they need to be enforced. But this is, so that's why it's a complex problem because just one or the other isn't necessarily going to do it. Uh, it needs to co-evolve. 
Yeah. So, uh, yeah, a uh, great talk. I enjoy it. And uh, one of the question is that, uh, I mean, uh, if we put the continuous usage of these creepy uh, apps into the uh, behavior model in terms of decision making concern the benefit and cost. So the benefit is more certain for people to use an app and the cost is very uncertain. So for example, I'm kind of don't care a lot of my privacy because mm -hmm. I did not know the cost yet. And it's mm -hmm. not happened right now, maybe in the far future, or maybe one day, but but for the benefit I use an app, I really need some tools or some functions like Google Map to solve my, my, yeah. my problem right now. And so I maybe because of this uncertainty, let me to kind of sacrifice mm -hmm. the privacy because maybe I, I don't I cannot calculate the how how much the cost it is. So actually, uh, uh, we didn't look at that particular aspect in our studies, but the literature on privacy concerns, uh, particularly from uh, the behavioral economics point of view, has looked at that type of aspect in uh, in detail. And in fact, the, the concept that you described, it's called hyperbolic discounting, mm -hmm. that near-term immediate benefits are uh, prioritized over uh, longer term costs and also people kind of hyperbolically discount those costs but what I and I didn't get into uh, detail in this particular talk but one of the things that we conceptual develop um, concepts that we developed in the work that I presented uh, with analogous concept called hyperbolic scaling and what that is is essentially uh, what people experience with one app they then expect with other apps as well so if this app that I use is privacy invasive and I, you know, kind of just say, okay, you know, Google's collecting this anyway, uh, or, you know, this app collects location data, then that means all apps are going to collect. So essentially people translate negative experiences or um, invasive practices of one app and tra translate that into uh, what they come to expect from any app. Right, and so we we term that as a as a concept of hyperbolic scaling, and that contributes to the normalization as well. Yeah, so like the privacy is going to the one or very big company behind that. So no matter how many app I use, all the data is going to very few big companies. So has that's a bit different, other. right? I think it's more like, oh, you know, I use this app; it's using location. Uh, and then when some other apps ask for location permission, I'm like, oh, well, those past three apps I use, use location. So every app needs my location or will use location anyway, no matter what. So, and that then over time, over many people, uh, starts normalizing these things because people don't treat app use as an isolated me and this app, but in an ecosystem of all different apps that I use and also all different apps that everybody that I know uses and what apps do in general, right? Okay, thank, let's thank uh, Samir one more time. Thank, thank you. you very much. I'm gonna stop our recording now. Um,